This is Dr. X.H. Balthazar. I am broadcasting once again to present my findings from the world of the uncanny. The 19th of February, 1957, an intriguing case has been presented to me. A former colleague's son, a boy named Jonathan Everett, sent me a recording detailing an account of something that took place not too long ago. His story is quite fascinating. I invited him here to tell it in full. Whenever you are ready, Jonathan. Before I tell you about my time on Bledlow's Island, uh, Liberty Island, as they call it now, but for the purposes of my account, I'll stick to the original name. I'd like to tell you a little bit about my history as a treasure hunter. Start wherever you like. As a boy, I was fascinated by the legends of different cultures, how they lined up with historical accounts, and what history we may have forgotten. But it wasn't until I unearthed my first treasure that I became fascinated with seeking the truth and thus my current vocation. Ah, <sighs> It was a cool autumn day when I found my first relic. My family took a trip to Saratoga National Park in upstate New York. I lost my way, shall we say, and found myself in a strange location. It was a clear field, not on any maps. I felt compelled to explore it. It was then that I came across a divot in the ground. It was a sizable divot, as it took me two paces to step over it. Testing the stability with my foot, I felt the ground bounce, as if there was a hollow space underneath. So I brushed away patches of grown over earth, and lo and behold, something was there. I ran back home and began to clean my find. Knowing little at the time, I made a mixture of vinegar and bicarbonate of soda. With a rag, I began wiping away the grime and caked on sod, until the relic glinted in the light. It was a knife of some sort. My heart was pounding. I, I was so excited I had never been more excited. As I continued to scrub, an assortment of jewels and pearls began to show. Most prominently, a large ruby forged into the face of the blade. It was a jeweled dagger. So naturally, I poured through all my texts, looking for the passage with a description that matched the blade. Then, in a reproduction of a Civil War diary, I found it. The knife was given to General Kenneth Young, a proud member of the Confederacy. The passage revealed that it was a gift from his wife. She begged him to keep it with him, to keep him safe, and he swore that it would never leave his side. A story for the ages. As I was still young and pretty green, I took the knife to be reviewed by someone who knew more than myself. The historian I brought it to thought it was more of a symbol, representing his unflinching loyalty to his cause and the deep love for his wife. They dismissed the knife as a conjecture of romantic antiquity and sent me back unacknowledged. Still, I knew that this was the find of a century and thus made it the cornerstone of my collection. As with General Young, this blade would never leave my side. Interesting indeed. Jonathan, can you tell me about Bledlow's Island? Of course. As I said after the discovery of Young's blade, I went in search of any and all forgotten history, which, of course, led me to the famous story of William Kidd and his many treasures. So, William Kidd was a privateer for the English during the 1500s. He was paid to secure any cargo being moved from settlement to settlement. However, his task turned out to be two years of penniless voyages, creating a frustrated and bitter crew. Inevitably, Kidd was forced to abandon his sponsored country and privateer on his own accord, plundering any and all who dared enter his waters. This way, he would amass a large fortune and earn great notoriety, particularly with the English whom he had betrayed. Kidd, suspecting an attempt on his life, buried his treasure across New England. And the largest stash, according to my research, came to rest on Bledlow's Island. What happened on the island, Jonathan? Through my own extensive research, I was able to pinpoint the location of where the treasure might be buried. 
The only issue with my investigation was that it was at the bottom of the Statue of Liberty, where the old Fort Wood was located. Hence, the new title, Liberty Island. Nevertheless, the drive to uncover Kid's treasure was eating me up inside. I had to do it. Whenever I embark, I wear an audio recorder on my person, just like you, Dr. Balthazar. Shall I play it? Please. It is currently 9.58 p.m. I have managed to evade security personnel on the island and have found my way down into the old fort structure at the base of the statue. I've walked through only a few halls and already made some substantial discoveries. I believe I will be able to find my way down to the lower levels where I can begin my dig. So far, we've seen substantial evidence that this treasure may have come to lie at this very spot. The lower levels of the fort are nearly cemented over, but with some investigation, I was able to find it. The farther I go, the colder it grows. I've made it to what I believe to be the oldest levels of the fort, but not without some trials. I did not know that they had security guards patrolling the depths of the structure. If it weren't for the glow of his cigarette, I would have revealed myself and my journey would have ended. Luckily, I was able to avoid detection. It is unclear what he's doing down here in the dark, all by himself. I can only think there's something hidden here that they might want to remain hidden. I'm on the right path. Remains. Skeletal remains. We have a femur, an incomplete breastplate and skull. A skull. Still clutching a pipe in its maw. Incredible. It is unlikely to be Kid himself, but there is no saying for certain that it isn't either. Fabulous finds to say the least, but my eyes are fixed on the treasure. I'll make a note to return to the spot once I uncover the treasure. Uh, I got turned around a few more times. Lost, to be honest. But I regained my bearings and located what could very well be the spot. I find myself now in what appears to be an old storage room. Perhaps the treasure is stashed among rotting barrels. I found it. I didn't think it would be this shallow in the dirt, but I have found it. It's a small chest adorned with jewels and pearls. There's a magnificent ruby at the center. It's really quite elegant. And the historical significance here is immeasurable. A find like this only comes once in a real treasure hunter's life, and I alone have made mine. What was that? There was a shot. I can't see anything. Maybe the guards caught on. I'll make my way out. But I find myself in the near freezing section of the fort. I can see my breath all around me. No, no, it's not my breath. It's smoke. smoke. There must be. It is so cold. Impossible. No. Cold. Cold. Figure in the dark. The smoke. Hello? Is someone there? Guard. Guard. I need help. That doesn't belong to you. Who is that? Holy God. What have I? Jonathan Everett claims to have seen an apparition of sorts. He describes a looming figure standing over him, donning a tricorn hat and puffing on a tobacco pipe. The booming sound at the end of this recording was, according to Jonathan, the shot of a flintlock pistol. He was found by the Parks Department, shivering and clutching a knife. There is no mention of a bejeweled chest in the police report. While this story is supernatural in nature, there is very little to inspire further study. 
as less than a week after my interview with Jonathan Everett, he was taken into custody by New York authorities. This was in connection to the disappearance of one Percy Nix, found eviscerated in the old fort under what is now known as Liberty Island. That is all I have planned for this broadcast. I shall have another transmission again soon. But for now, goodbye and good night. Thank <laughs> you.